Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. Father, help us to clear our minds of anything that would distract us today. Help us to look to your word to see what you have for each one of us here today. Help us to grow. Help us to get closer to you. Help us get victory in our lives, in things that we're weak in. Help us, Father, to bring honor and glory to you in all things that we do. Thank you for being the God that we can count on. Thank you for uh, blessing when we don't deserve it. Thank you for giving us salvation that we totally don't deserve. And thank you, Father, for your word that we can go to it any time, any place. We can pray to you any time and that you hear our prayers and answer it according to thy will. Bless this time, Father. Help us to be encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, our verse for this morning is Numbers fourteen eleven. It says, Then the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be before they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them. Now this takes place during the first visit to the promised land. Well, let me say this. They're at the Jordan, east side of the Jordan. Uh, They're about to go into the promised land for the first time. And uh, they send ten spies out. Uh, Two of them is Joshua and Caleb and the other eight. They go in. They come back with all kinds of goodies and everything. This place is really flown with milk and honey. So that was good. But the other eight said, by the way, there's giants in the land. If you ever want to know how the giants were, go back to Goliath, where it mentions his height and stuff like that there. It'll give you an idea how big these people were. He said, there's giants in the land, and that the, the, the cities have walls so huge, there's no way you're going to penetrate them. And all. So everything the eighth said was the negative side. Man, we can't go in there. We can't do anything. But yet Caleb and Joshua, hey, we can go in. God can take care of things. But guess what? The people believed the eighth. And God got really aggravated. And this is what God says after they said this. Is where uh, God comes in and says to Moses, how long will these people provoke me? And how long will it be before they believe me? Now think about this. They just came out of Egypt. They saw all those miracles of the plagues and everything and the sea, the Red Sea and just everything. And yet they're sitting here complaining. We can't go in there. So how does this apply to us? How long will Christians provoke God? I want you to think about that this morning. Every defeat a Christian experiences ultimately is rooted in unbelief. It's because you don't believe God can do what he says he can do. Now, here, unbelief is not a failure to believe that God exists. That's not the question here. The question is responding to what God would have you to do. And James reminds us, James chapter 2, verse 19 says this, Thou believest that there is one God? Thou does as well. The devils also believe and tremble. Remember reading the Old Testament, the legion? They said, please let us go here. Don't let us go there, you know. Let us go into the swines and all. They knew who Jesus was. They knew he had the power. But this doesn't mean that they got good or anything. You know, they had their decision a long time ago to make a decision, and they decided to follow Satan. Unbelief is a failure to trust God. That's what unbelief is. It's also expressed in some failure to obey God's word. Now, back in those days, God spoke directly to Moses, to Aaron, the high priest, and to other people. Today, we have the scripture. It's complete. Back then, we only had the Pentateuch. And I said we. (laughs) They had only the Pentateuch. So, we have the complete word of God now. So, God speaks to us through the word. That's why we're here this morning, to hear what God would have for each one of us. God has not shown us has not God shown us signs since we've been saved 
Have you not experienced? I got to assume everybody here that knows Christ as their Savior has experienced something. God did many signs and wonders before his people in the Bible. All through Scripture you see that. In the same way, God has shown us signs and wonders when he has answered prayers in our past. And I know in my life, if I could say it this way, God had, I think three times, but I know, remember two for sure. God answered a prayer before I prayed it. I know that's kind of dumb to say that statement. In other words, something happened in my life, and I planned on pay, uh, praying for it a little later, and God already did what I was going to pray for and brought that into existence to me. So I considered answering my prayer before I pr actually prayed it. He's paying forward. Yeah. <laughs> but that does not happen often. Most of the time, probably 99% of the time, God waits to the very end to test our faith. God remembers to act on our behalf as his people. He does not forget but do we remember to act on his word? Do we respond to something new when we learn it and say, hey, I'm going to start doing that now. Through God's grace, as I pray to him, I'm going to get victory in that area that I just learned today. As I've said many a times, there is something for everybody here today in this sermon. The question is, are you going to sleep? Are you going to doodle? Are you going to think about what you're going to eat afterwards? Uh, what are you going to do that distracts you from hearing what God would have for you? It might be the whole sermon. It might be one point. Uh, I've seen sermons before when I sat under preachers that one sub-point got a hold of my heart. It was just what I needed. I didn't need the whole sermon. Well, I, I didn't, it didn't hit me. That one thing changed my life. And, uh, there's, and I learned that there's always something God has got for each one of us. And it doesn't matter who's speaking. I don't care if it's the worst speaker in the world. I know I'm second from the bottom, but uh, but it doesn't matter because it's God's word that does the changing. It's not Glenn Taylor. It's no preacher. I don't care how good they can preach. So we must be careful not to focus on the hardships of our journey rather than fixing our hopes on where God has taken us in life. And God has a purpose for every one of us. And we got to get to our point where we realize that. And you, one thing you know for sure, everybody in here knows one thing for sure that God wants you to do, be his testimony. Be a testimony to everybody around you that is unsaved. That they see something different in your life. But there's other things. Some people are called to preach. Some people become great soul winners. And uh, some people, uh, you know, a, can be a, a godly bricklayer, a godly whatever, in whatever you do in your trades. Uh, what's kind of what Diane was talking about, the burden she has for a co-worker and all. Same thing, whatever. We complain about things we want rather than being thankful for what God has provided for us. Do we spend time in prayer thanking God? I've said this before in the past. If you go back, and I, I, I had never said this before, but if you have read Psalms, Psalms is full of prayers. And in those prayers is full of praises. If you read in the Old Testament, all the time when they go into prayer, they spend a quarter, to th a, a, a third of the time talking about what God has done before they ever get to the subject of what they pray, uh, came to pray about. You're the God Almighty. You know, you're the God that did this. You're the God that did that. And I can't help but tell you that that is exactly what God asks us in the New Testament. If you start reading where it talks about praying, how to pray, it always says with thanksgiving. You always see that someplace in that sentence. So the best thing I can think of, think of the children of Israel now. They've seen it all. But they forgot it all too. Now, you're not going to forget something if you keep thanking God for what he's done. It's going to be fresh in your mind. So the moment you go through something again, and you end up like the children of Israel at the Jordan, and go, oh, giants, all this and all that, you know, and you've got all these things you can complain about, you're going to go, oh, it's no big deal. God is before us. I don't know how he's going to do it. 
I mean, when you get to uh, Jericho, would you ever thought that they're going to go around that thing all those times and be quiet? Can you imagine how many hundreds of thousands of soldiers are going around that city and being quiet? <laughs> that's just a, that's a miracle in itself. And and then for the walls, and the scripture specifically says that the walls fell in. Not out, in. They were on the outside. And they went, and it says in scripture, they went straight in to the city after it fell. Just amazing. What part of the wall, just for curiosity, did not fall? Rahab. Ra Rahab's, where she lived. It's amazing what happens. By the way, I was talking to Fat Boy about this not too long ago. Uh, I I don't know if it was the History Channel or the uh, uh, Discovery Channel, but there was a guy there. I guess he's a I don't know a scientist or whatever, but he was researching about crossing the sea, Red Sea, and they actually dove down where they think they crossed and found artifacts that possibly proved their point that that's where they crossed where they may know now where they actually crossed and where Moses crossed with the children of Israel. And obviously, if the whole army got drowned there, there's got to be a lot down there. Chariots and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And you know what? This is what I say. You know what proves the Bible? Time. Time, as we go, keeps proving the Bible correct all the time just amazing so anyhow we spend time in prayer thanking god is what we should we must be thankful hearts so when the future comes when something happens what happens we're ready we got both barrels loaded and we know we go to god we present the problem to him which he already knows anyhow look at uh first timothy chapter 6 verse 8 it's an interesting thing and having food and raiment let us be there with content. I want you to think about that. Philippians 4.11 takes it even further. It says, Not that I speak of respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be a base and I know how to abound. Everywhere, everything, no, I'm sorry, everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer. I tell you, Paul had it. He understood. Now, does that mean as a Christian, we can't plan to go to a new home or buy a new bike or new clothes or whatever? No. But what he's saying is, when you're content in, in wherever you are at that moment, praise God for what you got. Don't be upset because... I'm going to bring this up in just a minute. I, I'm going to get ahead of myself. I don't want to say that. We must be content, learn to be content with the way God works in our lives. We must take the good with the bad. Because now God doesn't produce bad. But he permits bad to come into our life. It tells us that in James. And then, listen, I this has been something I've been studying off and on for a while, this thing. And for some reason, this quote, I'm going to, I'm going to read a paragraph of a quote, I did not, for some reason, put the man's name down. So, as I can tell you, this is a quote from someone. It says, "The person who truly trusts God is content with what He provides. A preoccupation with material things, whether diet or riches, is a substitute, uh, subtle, but a real expression of unbelief. For most of us, the abundance we sometimes crave will." be spiritually disastrous how much wiser to thank god for what we have uh, than to express unbelief by craving for what we lack we got to be careful about that it can get out of hand we must be careful that we do not blame god for our bad choices which is another problem what did israel do they made bad choices they complain. We can't go there. Matter of fact, if you go back and read this section, what they say in there is, we were better off in Egypt. Why didn't we go back there? And now they had it hard in Egypt, really hard. But yet, we had it better there than to go over there and get ourselves killed going into all those giants and all. 
going to a city to where you won't be able to enter the wall. Many Christians blame God for their sufferings, but most of the time the sufferings are consequences of their own choices in life. We all have weaknesses in certain areas, and there are times when we make bad choices which brings unpleasant consequences to us. Hopefully, we learn from those bad choices. And that's the key thing. You know, if you do make a mistake, learn from it. Go to the Lord and say, hey, hopefully I got this one down. You know, pray about it. And don't pray about it one time. Pray about it a bunch of times. Until, you know, we're habitual people. Everything we do, we do by habit. You know, I get up 5 o'clock every morning. Whether that alarm goes off or not, I wake up at 5 o'clock every morning. Or within at least a couple minutes. And uh, and uh, even when I want to sleep in, my idea of sleeping in was an hour. And uh, uh, I, when I said earlier about it, I had to sleep in the refrigerator, I was talking about Daytona with Fat Boy. <laughs> I now I know what you go through. <laughs> yeah, that was sixty-eight. <laughs> One night, the last night, I decided I wanted to get some sleep. I didn't get any sleep down there, so I turned it up to 70, and he apparently felt it later on. He didn't know I did it. He got up and turned it back down low. I said, man, I said, now I could have slept great there if I had an electric blanket because I enjoy being in a cold room, but I got to be warm in the covers, and there weren't enough covers in that house to cover me. It was still eight degrees warmer in my house. <laughs> As a result, if we do learn, we grow spiritually and maturity enters us. If you want to avoid sufferings in your life, we have to make better choices to obey God. That's what the children of Israel could have did. If they just would have obeyed, they would have went over and it would have been great. They would have conquered Israel, I mean, I mean the uh, promised land. Everything would have been wonderful, but they didn't. And by the way, even if you do do this, doesn't mean that God won't allow you to be tried and tested in your life. That's going to happen. He said they persecuted him. I mean, Jesus said this. They persecuted me. They're going to persecute you. Count on it. But when we're having difficulties in life, most of the time, it can be traced back to unwise choices. And, you know, and made earlier out of unbelief. Okay, so unbelief has a way of holding us back, which is blocking our obedience to the Lord. You know, sometimes the motive is fear. We want to obey God, but we're afraid to. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith, Hebrews is the faith chapter of the Bible. If you want to just go through, it's the Hall of Fame. But chapter, uh, verse 1, this is as simple, you don't have to be a theologian, to understand this verse 1, it's as simple as can be. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. When I pray, what am I doing? I'm praying and hoping God will complete the, my prayer. I hope that this is going to happen. But it also says it's evidence of things not seen. When I walked over to this chair, I hoped that it was going to hold me up. When I sat on it, I know it would hold me up. You don't need faith once you're sitting down. It's before you get to the chair is what you need the faith for. Same thing with us in our lives as Christians. We pray and pray. And, and you know that usually God waits to the last minute. Why? Or do you really trust him? Or are you just saying you do? Well, you know, I'm good for a couple prayer times, you know, a couple of days. But if my prayer isn't being answered a week later or a month later, uh, what's going on, God? And again, it could be just simply because some bad choices in your life. Sometimes our motive is just plain selfishness. And we feel that if we obey God, we won't get something we, be we really want. Think about that. I think that... I, 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 I remember doing something like that years ago. I, I remember that. And you don't think of it quite that way when you're praying. Get best example was the, the blazer that I had for those that remember my blazer. 
When I first went looking for one, I came across one because I wanted the diesel. I wanted the blazer. And I wanted that one that guy had. I found that later. That's not the one God wanted me to have. But I didn't know it that my selfishness, I wanted that. And the guy wanted like three thousand, two or 3000 more than what it was worth. And I still was willing to pay for it. And he actually dented it up while I was there. It hit his garage. He was trying to do some work on it. And I'm sitting there convincing him that I want to buy that thing. And he finally just said, no, no, no. And then he turned around and said, by the way, I know a guy that owns one in Columbia. Maybe he might sell his. He says, here's his number. And I called him up. The guy wasn't even selling it. And that's the one I ended up with. And not only that, but I got it cheaper than what it was worth. It was actually a newer model, Silverado package, which gives you everything in it. I, I mean, I got the best of everything because I learned the hard way to wait on God. Whatever our motive is, a failure to trust God is enough to obey him has consequences if we don't do it. Israel wondered. Now think about this. They didn't go into the promised land because of those eight. They believed the eight. Now over a million people were there. Over a million Israelites. They end up Going 40 years through the wilderness. Do you know why it was 40 years? There's a specific reason for the 40 years. So the generations would die. That's right. The only people that entered the promised land was four. Well, actually two. Four could have went in originally. But the four that didn't die, let's put it that way, the four would be Moses, Aaron, Caleb, and Joshua. Joshua and Caleb made it in. Moses, because he hit the rock and didn't talk to the rock, God wouldn't let him in, and he had to die, and look, he could look over, and Aaron died too. Uh, not at the same time, but you know. But everybody had to go through that 40 years, so when they got back to the entrance, nobody was alive that didn't so, look, trust the, the Lord. The left with Moses, nobody yeah. was alive. Not one of them alive. But see, God could have killed them all then and if he killed them all there wouldn't have been anybody to have kids to bring the new generation in so you think about how god did that it's pretty smart if we continue in unbelief we too will suffer consequences i know what some of you are thinking i trust god i have faith we now live in a dispensation of grace but this is not a get out of jail card free. Oh, we have salvation. But God will work. And now I want you to think about that. You got the verse right there. What does he say the first verse? What what's he end up saying? I I knew it by heart now. I don't want to miss. The Lord said unto him, How long will this people provoke me? Now think about what he just said there. I want you to take a moment and think about that. That's grace. What did he say? How long? He's been letting them go over and over again to all these days. They complained about everything, even on the way up there. We don't have meat. We don't have food. We don't have this. We don't have water. Twice Moses had to get water out of a rock and all. And God didn't respond right away. There's grace involved. But now we live in a dispensation of grace. But it's not a get out. God will get to the point in our lives if we're not responding to what he wants us to do that something's going to happen. I don't know what. I don't know how. But it will happen. How much wiser is it simply but put ourselves completely in God's hands to obey him without holding back? Just do what he says. That's a simple thing. Proverbs 19.21. I'm going to read this from the Amplified Version. I really appreciate the fact that uh, I've been reading Proverbs all the time because it's added to me things that I've been learning when I'm preparing sermons. Many plans are in a man's mind, but it is the Lord's purpose for him that will stand. You think about that now. We all got plans. We all got things we want to do. But what God would have us to do is what's going to stand at the end. 
when we get to heaven and we got to give an account of all the things we did, good and bad, as Christians, we don't lose our salvation, but we do have to give an account. What's going to stand is all of the things that we did for God. I don't know about you, but I, I, I don't. I kind of, in a way, dread that because I don't want to be brought up about all the things I didn't do that God wanted me to do or things I did wrong. I still get to get in heaven. But I wouldn't want to do it here on earth in front of a court. Take time to examine yourselves and see what changes are needed. Take time every week when you come in or even when you do your devotions. Don't just read to them and say, hey, I read my devotions. Read them to learn something. What do you have for me today, God, while I'm reading this? But uh, take time. Write down some of the things that you have made bad choices of that you need to correct in your life. Write it down and start taking it and praying it to the Lord every day. Write it down and just go, go before. And then when God gives you victory, scratch through it. Maybe put the date down or something. And all. But grow closer to the Lord. Make some serious decisions. And I'm not saying that you're all bad or anything like that, but all of us, including myself, have things to learn and to grow. We're never going to stop growing. We're never going to be perfect on this earth. Not until the day the rapture takes place and we're on our way to heaven do we get our glorified body. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you was, I hope you've spoken to every heart. I believe you have myself. I just pray that each one will take take it and use it and apply it to their lives. Whatever is needed. Only you know what's really needed in here. But I pray each one would grow closer to you and become the, the Christian they should be. Bless us this day, Father. Help us in Christ's name. Amen. We pray that we have been a blessing to you. For further assistance, call us at 864-270-1472 anytime. Send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.